Hey everybody, Dr. G here. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and body language expert, and today we're going to be analyzing more about Letitia Stout. Last time we looked at what I believe is her motive. This time we're going to be talking about mental health, and we're going to be analyzing the FBI interview with her and looking at her body language. A couple of real quick things before we get started. One, I need to make a correction from the last video. In the last video, I said she put Gannon in a briefcase. Obviously, that's not correct. Obviously, it was a suitcase. That was my mistake. My brain and my mouth weren't working, and I just didn't catch it. But I wanted to let you guys know, I have read the comments. I do know that you guys noticed that because my viewers are super detail-oriented and awesome. So I appreciate you letting me know. Last thing, please like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right, let's go. I want to talk for just a couple of minutes about dissociative identity disorder, otherwise known as DID. Now, the defense in their opening statements talked about how she has a fragmented identity. And they indicated that they have a Yale-educated expert who's going to be speaking to this fact. Before they talk to that expert, I want to throw some questions out there that you guys can be thinking about when you're watching this expert testimony, because there's some really important questions. One of the essential questions they need to ask is how many people they've seen that claim to have DID, and how many of those were malingering? Because one thing that we know is that many people who claim to have DID are in fact malingering. And just to be clear what malingering is, that's faking bad. It's not at all unusual for people to malinger to avoid responsibility for a crime. And that's why in this case, there has to be a very, very, very thorough ability to eliminate malingering as a possibility. And I really think that it's, it's upon the expert to explain in extremely detailed terms why they know beyond any shadow of a doubt that this is not malingering. Because there are some other subsequent questions that are going to clarify why that would be a concern of mine if I was an expert evaluating someone like this. The next question would be about the lack of amnesia. Now, one thing that we have seen is that she tells many different versions of many different stories. So there's been Eduardo, Quincy, a stomach full of cash. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, just understand each one of these is a different explanation for what happened around Gannon's murder. And it's not like some that she forgot details. She's giving completely different explanations. That is not indicative of DID. What you need to understand is that if somebody is dissociating, they'll be in an altered state that they won't remember, or won't remember well at least. If they won't have different versions of events. You're not going to have five identities that saw things five different ways. That is not at all how this works. So the expert really does need to be able to explain why does she lie so much? Why does she just make things up? Because that is not typical of people with DID. The next question needs to be, how does someone with DID commit acts of violence against a child, much less horrific acts of violence? Having DID isn't just magically having different identities. Each one serves a role. And because it's thought to come from childhood trauma, if someone is to be violent with DID, which is exceedingly rare, it would be self-protection. There's nothing self-protective about viciously murdering a child. The only way that you could make sense of violence related to DID would be if someone was in the identity of a protective role. And there's no way that that can make any kind of sense when it comes to murdering an 11-year-old child. Why does she lie so much? How can you explain that? Because that's not DID. People can be seen as not telling the truth with DID sometimes because if they dissociate or they forget something, they'll claim to have gaps in memory or they might only vaguely remember something, they don't just outright lie. They don't have a history of just making stuff up. So the last question has to do with the timeline of events. Gannon was murdered, and then the body was disposed of. This was not all done in a short amount of time. This was done over a protracted period of time. So is the suggestion that this was all one identity that was in control that entire time, that this vicious person who murdered a child in a horrible way was still that same personality when interacting with police? and interacting with everybody else? Or, or is there a suggestion that it was going between identities? There are some leaps in logic here that have to be accounted for in, in amazing detail. There can't just be an I don't know. That, that's not going to be good enough. The expert needs to explain, if they believe she has DID, how that's possible. As I said, the psychological experts have not provided testimony yet. And if they come out and provide profound information that answers all of these questions and makes it make sense in a different way, I'm always willing to accept and look at new information. I'll do a follow-up video explaining my reaction to the stuff that they come out with, if that's the case. But in the meantime, a defense of DID is very hard for me to make sense of, given all the available information we have right now. Now we're going to watch former FBI Special Agent John Grusing interviewing and interrogating Letitia Stouck. This is really masterfully done. It's really interesting. And we're going to look at what her body language says. They didn't have enough manpower to work in. Okay. So they called the FBI. Right. Part of the 
for the, through the FBI, um, an extension of the profiling unit. If you don't, I can to... talk to you, but I mean, the the last time I asked for an attorney talking to them, I wasn't allowed that after I asked. That's not how this is going to go. This would be, as I talked about in the last video where she is constantly talking about being a victim. I'm going to point that out here and there. But once again, she's already point, complaining about how the last one went. She's already pointing about how they mistreated her, which of course she is, because that's what she's done through everything we've watched. A conversation. You have more integrity being FBI than she would do that. I've got a family to protect. Okay, so I'm not going to violate any you don't mind standing outside trying to intimidate you. I want this to be your statement okay. and our conversation. What's so great about the way that he is presenting this is that people that you interact with like this, like her and like other folks, which I'm sure he's dealt with plenty, they are control freaks. So when you try to control the situation and say, I'm in control, you're going to do what I say, it doesn't always go well. Sometimes they're going to give you less information because of that. So a calm, measured approach where you're basically saying, look, you, you have some control here. You get to choose what you want to do is going to help disarm people like that. It is going to make them more likely to be compliant to you and actually talk to you. Does it mean they're more likely to tell the truth? Obviously not. But it does mean they will at least give you an interview. And as you can see, now that she feels more in control, her body language is loosened up a little bit. Her hands are still interlocked, like still crossed, but she looks a little bit more comfortable. She's not sitting with her hands across her abdomen like she was before. So... But immediately, as soon as he faced her, his body language is opened up. He's ready for di direct, clear communication. You'll see her arms folded into her stomach immediately. Once again, she's closing herself off. She started to feel a little bit more confident than once it got going. She's immediately going to close off. Let's watch her do that again. So, I was thinking of a lot of things to say to you today because I... Is not or whoever is not the case, okay. Gannon is alive, okay, and I can help you. Okay, great. But see, here's the problem. When I reached out to people about getting help, I said, hey, I need some." So when she's trying to manipulate, she gets a little bit more interactive, a little bit more open. You see her close off a little bit more when she feels like she's going to be getting asked questions. There's a difference between lying when you're just talking and being asked a question and having to lie and respond to it. Someone who's going to help me to help you guys, I couldn't get that from me. We don't have a suspect. Somebody's killed, but we have nothing. Okay. Then we will look at that person to see what drew that, that homicide That homicide there. Why did those... They start talking about a suspect, and if they have a suspect, and that's when her body shifts. When that gets brought up, her body shifts and faces a little bit further away from him. When we're comfortable talking to people, we face them. We have open lines of communication. Let's watch that again. Don't have a suspect. Somebody's killed but we have nothing okay. then we will look at that person to see what drew that that homicide that homicide there why did those two people interact at that time okay and then we'll also you know done the cfi stuff and looked at all that you know body fluids all over the house and garage and whatever else so that's all been done um i'm curious to you notice that just that moment he talked about body fluids all over the house and the garage and that's been done so it's reminding her that they, they have a lot of information already. He's reminding her in a very subtle way that they already know a lot. Something the special agent talked about prior to this video was that she depersonalizes Gannon. And once again, that goes back to what I talked about in the last episode, is that she sees Gannon as an object, not a person. You depersonalize somebody and you don't have emotional connections, not any genuine emotional connections. You can treat somebody like an object. Having him all the time it became more of like, I, I would hear, I love you. Any kid, would, any well, what's, other. What's the biggest disagreement you had with Cannon? The, the biggest disagreement. All right, now you're seeing the body language close off a little bit. He's asking about the biggest disagreement. She's bracing herself around her abdomen a little bit again. If I said anything like, well, and I probably shouldn't have, but I did, I would be like, well, if she quit doing this, we could, she could pay for it. And I would always figure out a way but then it was like and so now she's talking about something that doesn't really have much consequence but the initial brace of when was the biggest conflict you had to now her opening back up so you can see the body language following the initial feeling but then she can get back into manipulation mode very quickly you know i'd say i, I wanted him to see that it's a certain incident 
you want to know. The biggest disagreement you had was this a certain time? Or you no, just we never had like... So the special agent goes back and brings her back around because she does have a tendency to try to take things off track, to try to change the subject. And he's bringing her back to this to try to get her to give an actual answer. Big, like there was never any like a uh, big all out or whether or not he did something. If he that, did something, that has to happen if you're a parent. Right, right, right. I'm not joking. What you're saying I thought you were asking Again, me like no, you're I'm like. More, I'm more looking at this from Gannon's point of view. I'm not judging you. No, I thought you were asking me. So now she's locked her hands underneath her leg starting to feel more uncomfortable, starting to brace herself a little bit more. Oftentimes people do that. They hide their hands when they are trying not to say something or when they're trying to hide something or be deceptive. So not shockingly, that's the approach she's taking right now. More of like, you know, like, like whipping or like Feed switches or, like or, or, like, or like something like that. No. So what's the most intense time you've had? So he's really trying hard to get information now. He's asking her very direct questions. She keeps skirting around it. He just shifted his body language to be even more open and direct with her. His hands are very open now, which is a sign of vulnerability. It, it, I don't know if this was intentional on his part, but he's showing vulnerable body language. Hey, why don't you just let me know this information? As far as you're yelling, he's yelling, that sort of thing. Um, you know, when Gannon was just doing something that's totally irrational, unreasonable, I have a boy, I know. Yeah. They don't behave all the time. Right. So what did Gannon... I love that he brings in, once again, personal stuff because it, he's reminding her, this is reality. I have a framework of reality that I operate from. Boys misbehave. Now tell me about times he has. Don't deny that it's never happened. I don't know of any like, specifics. I just know that we would have. It wasn't a big enough fire to... to um, what color was it? Do you remember? Was it yellow? I don't remember. It wasn't in a color. Was it wasn't color. It wasn't in a color. Because I think, what, blue burns the hottest, and then you have stuff, it's stuff. This former special agent does such a brilliant job of, of trying to get her to be specific. Right now he's explaining how she can't, she says she can't remember what color the fire was, and he's explaining how different types of fire have different colors. So he's trying to remind her, I'm aware of reality, and you should be able to answer this question. Stuff gets involved in the fire, you have a yellowish or reddish color. I don't remember. Don't remember? I don't remember. Oh, can you show me how tall it was? Like, do you I don't remember? remember. It wasn't tall. It wasn't tall? I don't feel like it was that tall. I mean, but my tallest might be different. I don't. This is another way that she tries to maintain control, refusing to give information. And in essence, she's going to try to frustrate people with this as well, which is, I'm going to answer exactly what I want to answer. I'm not going to answer specifics. Aside from just being concerned that something could be verifiably incorrect, I think that there's some passive aggressiveness in this as well. I've seen the crime scene with those. Mm -hmm. Okay, what happened in the bedroom was not Gannon slinging his blood on the wall. Well, that that's totally like not even to do with anything. Yeah, that's but... why I'm so like upset about bedrooms and, and, and all that. All right, so she just went from open body language to closing off, kept her hands up trying to say, hey, it wasn't me. But all of a sudden, her legs started to close, her body shifted. That makes her feel uncomfortable once he starts talking about the crime scene, which I assume is intentional on his part. Let's go back and see that again. Well, that that's totally, like, not even to do with anything. Yeah, that's but... why I'm so, like, upset about bedrooms and, and, and all those things. Because I understand you're an expert. I know that. But I'm telling you that... Just, I'm gonna need like protection. Well, see, you can't make me guess. That's not, not fair to me. Why would I keep fair to Gannon. if you're not gonna help me? You tell me how to help you. I already did. Right. So as you can see right now, there's that leaning forward. There's the discomfort. You know, oftentimes when we see people slouch, that's a real loss of confidence. So at this point in the interview, she has to know that she is not doing well in it. She has to know that this is all bad for her. So that's the body language we're seeing, is that she internally feels that as well. I already did tell you. Our child had everything in the world. Why? I have no motive. None. So I guess she's thought about this, about the idea that she's, that she's had no motive, so to speak, because her defense brought that up in the opening part as well. And while I disagree with that idea, it seems that she's been thinking about that. Don't have the first motive. Everything I wanted in my life, I had it. Why? 
doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. A lot of the time, what happens inside yeah. of a house? And, sir, I don't even know what you're talking about. I All I can tell you is, I don't know. Nope. So at this point in an interview, there's no chance of coming back. There's no chance of her opening up or giving any more information. It's towards the end of it anyway. I'm sure former Special Agent Grusing knows the signs of when you can't get any more out of a suspect, and we've really hit that wall at this point. No reason to. In fact, to go on the record, I had a way better relationship with Gannon than I did with Lana. I hope watching this video has helped you better understand why DID truly is an unusual defense at this point given all the facts that we have. And I also hope that you can better understand how manipulative people work in situations like her interview with the FBI. Before we wrap up, I do want to thank everybody once again for all the comments and suggestions. I read them all and the suggestions are great, so they really are going to help form the next content that I do. Once again, just wanted to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to keep seeing more from me. Thanks again for watching.